sit with your feelings. A lot of that is in the, the work that I do now where just be present with what it is that is passing through your body, what, what your heart is calling for, what your heart is dealing with, because it gives you information on this path, this life path that you're on. When you were scouted as a teenager uh, by some modeling agent, you weren't thinking, oh, I get to be on a cover of a magazine. You were thinking, I can pay some more bills or I can <laughs> provide financially well, be for myself. <laughs> Truth be told, it took me a very long time. I had been approached several times by, you know, locally by people in Barbados who said I should be a model. Mm -hmm. And it's it wasn't something I ever wanted to do. Um, I, I actually, as an academic, I thought that it was a waste of time, truthfully. Um, and it's, it's only after I got scouted very haphazardly, um, that I saw the potential for money in it. And, and yes, at that point I was like, okay, well, this is a money making opportunity. Then sure. I'm going to explore it. Not because I want to be a model, but because I have the opportunity to make some money. But you were also thinking of becoming a lawyer, right? Like you were in some kind of law program when you were in your later teens. Yeah. So at the time that I, I got discovered as a model, I, um, I was already in law school. Um, mm -hmm. I was pursuing a, a law degree, but that also happened pretty haphazardly. Um, my dad's twin sister, she she called me one day. And, uh, well, when everybody was enrolling for university, I still hadn't decided whether I wanted to go to university, nor had I decided that I wanted to be a model. I just hadn't decided anything. Mm -hmm. I did not know what I wanted to be. And she called me up and she was like, listen, you have to make a, a decision. You're either going to be a lawyer, you're going to be a doctor, take a pick, figure it out. You know, and then I asked her, I went through the process with her. I was like, how long do I have to be in school to be a doctor? She said seven years. And I was like, nope, that's too long. And I said, how long do I have to be a lawyer? She said five. And I was like, okay, fine, I'm going to do that. And then luckily for me, I had the grades to get into the law, law program. And so that's how I ended up signing up to be in law and um and I did that I, I entered school way after everybody else like two weeks after everybody had gone their books and their bag and they went to orientation and they all met each other and they knew what classes they were going to I was just popping up into school two weeks later and now trying to figure out everything um and I'm grateful for my aunt to my aunt for that um because you know it has paved the rest of my life um yeah so that's how I got into the law program and then during that period of time I was also scouted and so I kind of have always done the two the two things in my life you had to pause the law school thing right to go and and, and do some more modeling in Jamaica so was that a big decision for you at that time it was <laughs> it was a wild ride during that time so in the middle of my law degree, so my on what you call your undergrad, or for us, it would be a bachelor's of law. Um, that first program was three years, and I did that in Barbados at the University of the Cape Hill campus. Um, and in my last year, I was presented with the opportunity to move to Jamaica and to pursue modeling. And so, in a very unheard of way, like unprecedented, does not happen. I kind of did law school at a distance. So I would travel back and forth. Mm -hmm. And um, my tutors were not pleased at all because law is a full-time program. You have to attend 80% of your, your classes. And I was just winging it. Um, and I was going back and forth between, between the two countries. Um, so once I finally did complete my law degree, I then put my the second part of my degree, which would be our legal certificate or the bar exam. I put that on hold for four years. And within that four year period, I traveled and I lived abroad and I, I modeled internationally. So um, I've heard you talk about your roommate in South Africa. You were in South, you were in, I'm assuming you were in um, Cape Town or Johannesburg modeling and mm -hmm. your roommate's Cape brother Town. had HIV or something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah, there was, um, wow. 
I don't even remember her name now. That's so wild. Yeah, um, she, you really did your research here now. You have to go <laughs> dig real Everybody deep. says That's that. Old, yes, I did old, my research. I don't even know where you, I'm trying to wrap my brain as to where you found that. Um, wow. Um, yeah, that we there was a model living in our um, model apartment and she, she was, we were living in Cape Town and she was from the townships, but because of, you know, her modeling career, she was able to move herself out of the townships and live with us in Camps Bay, which is a really beautiful area. And, and, but we, the reality of her life, man, her life was rough. Um, and her brother, yeah, her brother had HIV and he eventually died from it. And I mean, she gave me a glimpse into what that was like, you know, living with a family member who was suffering in that way and also living in a township or a society that, you know, um, that really mm, carried the stigma around the disease, you know. Um, and what her family had to endure. And I just became very sensitive to her plight and, you know, the plight of persons living with HIV. And I mentioned it because you started a couple of charities later um, related to yeah. both that as well as your own experience of losing a parent at a young age. Yeah. But yeah. Um, before we get to that, you were, you had, that was after you became Miss Barbados, right? The when you started those, happened. yeah. When you started yeah. those charities, yeah. So let's talk about that for a minute. How did you? If you're not even into modeling, you're just doing it for the, <laughs> for the money. <laughs> um, why are you in a Miss Barbados pageant? Because normally people who do those kinds of things, they're in pageants since they're like you know 12 years old. They're always yeah. in pageants. Uh, you know, I have to say that. I'm really grateful for the path that my life has taken because now I can truly embrace it. But everything that I did, like these things that I did on my path were presented to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I never, like I never saw myself as a pageant girl. I actually was very rough around the edges as a child. I was a tomboy. I just could not see myself on anybody's stage, you know, talking about world peace, which is literally, you know, how we we speak about it I can see myself doing it and um I was encouraged to to join and I at first I refused and then you know eventually I I agreed to do it and it became a really enriching experience in my life and kind of changed everything in my life you know um so that's how I got into it just like modeling just like going to law school that's how I ended up entering Miss Barbados world. And, you know, what kept me there was the ability to do the charity because I, I felt like, okay, now I could apply meaning to this thing. You know, that's what kept me interested in, in, in doing the pageant. Well, let me ask you this. You and I have, you know, we know each other personally and, uh, right. and I hope I, what I'm going to say next isn't too personal, <laughs> but so. You have told me before that you were your your beauty was never really validated as a child growing up, right? So I'm just curious, did you see yourself as beautiful enough to win Miss like did you think you were going to win Miss Barbados or were you just doing it because you could do it? No, I didn't think I could win Miss Barbados. Um you know, I hate the conversation of, uh, I should say I hate the conversation around uh, around beauty is a challenging one because you know for many people listening, they might you know roll their eyes. I, I've heard like Oprah have several conversations about people who she thinks that you know are pretty, and you know they them talking about their own beauty. Um, and so I hate to be that person, but to answer your question, I didn't. I appearance was never a thing for me because life was actually happening to me. You know, mm -hmm. at a very young age, I lost my father. At 18, I lost my best friend. Um, I was surviving. So my outward appearance was definitely not something that I took stock of. And I think my family didn't address it in that way. You know, we, we were very much going about, we were all very much surviving. And so 
there were no affirmations in that way, you know, <laughs> coming across in that way. Um, and it's a very much a Caribbean society where sometimes um, you, you don't always have that flattery being expressed, you know. Um, so I, I, I grew up sort of oblivious to, you know, how I presented in the world. Um, and in many ways, I still, you know, that's such a subjective thing, but uh, I didn't think I would win Miss Barbados. I, I, you know, I have same insecurities as everyone else that would have entered the, the pageant. You know, pageantry is something where competition and comparison runs high. And so, you know, I fell victim to that as well. Um, but I did know, I, what I did do was pour myself into my charity. And I made the charity the biggest thing that it could have been. Um, and and that was what I was hoping would get me, you know, would was hoping would make me win more than anything else. So what was the first, when they called the name of the runner up and you two were standing there, what was the first mm -hmm. thing that, that entered your mind? Well, first off, I would go back to say, so they, they asked my question, which I don't remember what it was. I think I hated how I answered it. And so immediately after, because I blind in my mind, I blind. I said something I cannot tell you what I said, or I can't tell you what they asked me. But I remember immediately after I went backstage and like I started to cry, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I am definitely not winning this pageant." So I, at the time when they were calling the winners, I was just there for the formality of it, and um, and then when they called my name, <laughs> I literally. I, this was the first time in my life that I cried tears of joy. Mm. I had never experienced it before. Like my, and it was so involuntary. Um, and I started to cry. And also I was very much not a crier. Um, was your whole family there? A teenager. The, yeah, my whole family was there. In the audience? My whole family was there, yeah. Yeah, my mom, my aunts, my cousins. Yeah, everybody was there. Did and they felt like dad? they... No, I didn't. Um, not in that moment. Not in that very moment. But you know, in your quiet moments, you do you do wish that certain things, your life played out in a certain way. Um, but in that moment, I had my mom, and I she was so proud, and you know, making her pr proud, you know, makes me feel good. So mm. that was my focus. All right, so you're 24, you're Miss Barbados, um, and you have now you have a platform to launch this charity. And what's happening in the background? Is there like a next level, like you're going to compete for Miss Universe, Miss World, or something like that while you're, and, and maybe you can impact even more people? Like, are you taking right, it seriously so, now? <laughs> yeah, so the process is that, you know, you enter your national pageant and if you win you then go on to compete on the world stage with uh 20 or 30 other countries um and the aim is to either win or to place in the the top five top ten of of this because it now gives you a platform to do more whatever your mission is in the world so if you do have a direction that you want to become you know some kind of world ambassador you want to do charity on a larger scale you want to impact uh impoverished in in africa or wherever you want whatever you want to do that now gives you the, the opportunity to do that so at the point that i i won miss barbados i did sit up and i was like okay well this is what we're doing and if if we're if i am now carrying the title then i'm going to step fully into it and that's what i did um the charity became even more important to me at that that point in time and um yeah and i went to the to miss world to win <laughs> and 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 to car and to fly the Barbados flag high, um, in a way that you know I felt like I could do. When you when you're um, representing a country, uh, when you win that competition, do you have do you do they give you like a team of advisors and people to hand handlers and? 
you know, do you get like this whole other, is this whole other reality sort of created or this bubble created around you? Do you get a bunch of guys like hitting you up, trying to date you? And wow. like, is that like just completely a different thing? Cause you're 24. So you, you still got some growing to do, you know, even though you've been through a lot, but I imagine this would be a, maybe an accelerator on life in certain ways. No, it definitely it was an accelerator. Um, it's a very, it was a prestigious title as well. So you carried yourself in a very diplomatic way and it accelerated you to like an actual representative of your country. And depending on the country that you were from, you did have handlers. You had people, a team of people who worked out your wardrobe, um, the way you carried yourself, the things you did and did not do, the things that you engaged in and did not engage in. Um, but I was also, I was from Barbados. And so my team was really small, um, uh, but powerful. We did a lot for the small country that we were, that we are. Um, we got my wardrobe together. We put together a campaign. We raised funds. We did a lot in a very short period of time to be able to, to have me represent Barbados in a very strong way, uh, which we were successful at. Um, but it's, like I said, it's, it's very prestigious. So there isn't much time to focus on uh, the showmanship of it. Like it, it becomes a role, you know, at that point in time. So I don't know about the guys and that. That's, that's very much not. Well, I read that you, you said you weren't even dating anyone. You weren't even thinking about dating during that time. Like you were so focused on on the things that you were up to. Um, did you like being, did you like being a celebrity, a local celebrity? Being being rough I, around the edges, as you say? It, it was all very new to me. Um, there were aspects of it that I appreciated and then there were aspects of it that I really did not like. I think during that time, I became very aware that that fame or celebrity wasn't something that I was going to pursue further, like on a bigger mm -hmm. scale. Um, but what I did appreciate is that because of the impact of the charity, I would have, I was able to have conversations with regular people who would just approach me. So in the supermarket, I would, I, I remember uh, this one lady who approached me because the charity was helping her brother. And we were able to have a, a conversation and I got greater insight into her life and the impact that of the work that we were actually doing. And so I met a lot of people, it, it was very grassroots in that way. I met a lot of people on the ground and that I think filled me up more than anything else. But I didn't like that I couldn't just do simple things at one point in time. Like I couldn't just go to the supermarket with my hair tied up and like no makeup. But you know, Did that you get was fully a, done up in a just very to go to the small way. No, I don't want to make it sound like that. No, but you know, you have to be presentable <laughs> when you have a platform, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so fame and celebrity was never a focus for me. So then so describe your transition back to law school. How did that happen? Because now you're like Miss Famous Barbados, like now you're going back to law school. Yeah. Um, well, for me, it was important for me for, to complete what I had started. Mm -hmm. uh, and after my reign had been completed, I remember sitting down with my late, the late prime minister. He's now late, but uh, the prime minister at that time, David Thompson, who was also a lawyer. Uh, and he, we were talking about, you know, where do I go from here after being Miss Barbados? And he said, you know, you should go back to law school. You, you, you should complete that, that cycle. And that's exactly what I did. I, I had a very clear opening after my reign had ended and I used the opportunity to go back to law school. Would you shortly after that, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was saying shortly after that, I picked up the franchise for Miss Barbados mm -hmm. within that same year. So having taken a break away from law school, right? Would you say you were more passionate about it or you just wanted to complete what you started? It was a transition back uh, mentally to get mentally to get back into that because law school is very taxing and it requires your to your brain to be in overdrive and extreme discipline 
um, mm-hmm. and after you've lived a very uh, uh, a life where you're you're handled or either you know you can create and design your life uh, going into a structure like law school was was challenging so that was a transition but um, I also had purpose going through law school um, so I very much wanted to be present there and to complete that and and have that added to to my name. And what attracted you to the Human Rights Council? What, why that area as opposed to any other area of law? Oh, no, man. I, I, I think, you know, now at that point, I was on the thread of humanity, you know, having done the charity. Um, and life was just constantly pulling me in those spaces. So being on the ground, talking to people who are afflicted in different spaces, and even through the you know, at law school, we had a legal clinic where you would have to take in clients, practice clients, but they were real people with real issues. Um, and I, I just became very attracted to the human rights side of, of law. And at the time that I did that, um, living in Jamaica, I, the opportunity was also presented uh, to work with that um that organization to create change. Um, it was very grassroots as well. We handled the affairs of death row inmates, the appeals, and ensure that their human rights were being um, observed. Uh, and like I said, it was just in the thread of, of where my heart was at that time, I think. It doesn't sound like the most lucrative uh, career path. So someone, you know, being a self-described hustler, <laughs> How were you going to make your, how were you going to, you know, supplement that? Like, what were you, what else were you doing for, for right. income? Um, at that time, I was, again, still juggling, modeling and mm-hmm. doing this, this stint. Uh, money at that time was not very much a priority for me. And mm-hmm. it was meant to be, it was meant to be temporary. It wasn't lucrative, but I was making, I was, I was salaried. So I was making money. Um but I think I was so consumed with with what we were doing at the time. Like, you know, we used to go around to all the prisons in Jamaica and meet with um, the prisoners and stuff like that. So it was very consuming and you you your heart becomes attached to this work. And I think depending on who you are, money then takes a back seat, you know. Uh, but like I said, it was just temp- a temporary, uh, it was for a season. Right. And then you worked in family law, right? Yeah. So eventually after I became a lawyer, I moved into, this was years later. I, um, Mm -hmm. I worked in criminal and then I also worked in family law. Yes. Did you feel like you were living your purpose at that time? To be honest, no. Um, I felt like I was doing what I had to do. And I don't know Mm -hmm. that I had uh, a conscious understanding of purpose in a way that I do now, but it was conflicting for me because law was not, um, has never really sat squarely in uh, in my heart. It was something that I could do. I was, I was good at in different spaces, but it wasn't fulfilling for me. Um, but at the time, I within that space still I was doing what I felt I should do so family was something I felt I should do because of the the human rights behind it and the impact that I I would have been making you know in people in in people's lives um but I wouldn't say that it was a purpose no well that's what's interesting because you know it's like you you're doing the conventional thing and and what would be considered on paper to be a very high level conventional thing, right? You're working in law, right. yet you're also having impact. You're working with death row inmates, you're working with families, and you had an opportunity to kind of peek behind the fame veil and see what that was right. like. And uh, so you, you kind of had a, and and you you were living in paradise. So it's like you have all of the <laughs> things that everyone is striving for, yet you don't feel right. like you're you're living your purpose. So what did you, I know, I know you, you also in a previous conversation we had, um, you talked about this experience at a, at a cafe in Barbados where someone confronted you 
Trinidad, um, yeah. Trinidad, excuse me. And I'm not sure when that actually happened chronologically, but maybe you could you could um, talk a little bit about that if it relates to this subject of not feeling fulfilled inside and how that sort of shifted your path. So that that encounter happened in Trinidad, like you said, at a coffee shop where this girl that I know, and I don't even know if she knows the impact that she's had. Um, her name is Asha Wadada. Um, she came and she sat across from me at the coffee table and she was like, you know, I can see that you're not fulfilled and that whatever you're doing in your life right now needs to change, right? Um, this is all unsolicited, right? You didn't say anything. You didn't like open a yeah. conversation with her nothing I said nothing she just came and she sat um and that ha that happened at the tail end of living years of a life doing something that I wasn't meant to do um so going back to the first part of your question where it's like you seem to have all the things so you're doing this high profile career and all that um but it's interesting that you could have all those things and not know what you have when you're not conscious to it when when you are when you're a survivor and I, I think the reason I operated in a very transactional way in my life is because I was dealing with a lot of pain or not dealing with it so I was very much living as a, a survivor would you know which is just one foot in front of the other and I was letting life drive me and, you know, I was passing a lot of time. When I really think back about it, I passed a lot of time, luckily doing things that people approved of or that were, you know, had some kind of purpose inadvertently or had some kind of stature inadvertently, but I wasn't mm -hmm. consciously making those choices. So, you know, it wouldn't land on me that I was living in paradise or it wouldn't land on me that I was doing a job that other people would strive to do. Um, and maybe that sounds um, almost silly, but uh, that, that that's really what I think about it. My pain stopped me from appreciating the the path that I was on, and that culminated, like like I said, Asha pierced through that years after, and she really made me think about the life that I was living. I I then sat in that coffee shop and I asked myself, why am I here? Why am I living in Trinidad? Because I, I had finished law school at least five years ago by this point in time. I was practicing, but I didn't have any family there. You know, there was nothing tying me to the country. And it was the first time that I was like, what am I doing? Where am I going? What do I actually want in my life? What, what career am I actually pursuing? Do I want to do law? Do I like it? You know, what, what else do I want to do? You know, where do I want to live? You know, um, so I became... In many ways, I woke up in that moment. And what what was the next move then? What 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 became apparent to you that you needed to do? Well, I I needed to leave. Um, I remember in that that season of my life, I quit my practice. I mm. moved out of the apartment that I was living in, and I moved into a smaller apartment. And I went really quiet for about three to four months. Um, Did you have money saved go, up? I I was doing okay. I was hustling, so mm -hmm. I had my, you know, I was still practicing. I had clients, but mm -hmm. I wasn't in office like I had mm -hmm. been before. Um, I was working for a group of companies in Trinidad, and I I quit that, and I kept one or two clients, but um, and then I would get involved in different projects. I was still running Miss Barbados at that time, but I. I remember just completely downsizing and uh, I think I lost my train of thought. Oh, we were just talking about the next step after that conversation and you recognize that, hey, I need to do something different. Um, right. I guess what I'm really asking is how did you make your way to LA? Right. So, yeah. So after that, like I said, I quit my practice. I, I moved into a smaller apartment and I went really quiet. And during that, three to four month period is when I would go to the that coffee shop every day it was the only thing I did um for that period of time that actually kept my sanity 
strange enough. Um, you would just go there and just like e do emails and just or read yeah. or. Yeah, I would do emails. I would do little projects. You know, um, I would people would come into the sh coffee shop. We would sit and we would chat, and that's how I would meet people and end up in in other projects. You know, um, I ended up tasting their menus for them because I had I, I would stay there all day. <laughs> you know, um, and then. During that period of time, a friend of mine, my friend Jenna, she approached me and she was like, uh, there's this co this there, there's this therapy course that I would like you to do. Um, and it's it's really intense and and I think you should do it. And it took me a really long time to say yes to that, but I eventually did, and that is what changed my life. So I went into deep therapy. Um, that was the beginning of therapy in my life, which was probably like five or six years ago. And from there, I slowly came home to myself. Can That's you describe a little bit of what that deep therapy was was like? Uh, it, it was like 12 hours a day. Mm. Um, it was with a small group of people. It was here in California. Um, and we went through, you know, every aspect of your life. We went through your thought process, your traumas, your, um, you know, your vision for your life, your outlook on, on yourself, um, peel back the layers of everything that, everything that had happened and everything that you presented yourself to be, your mindset, everything. Had um, Jenna gone through this? Yeah, she went through it before me. And was going through a different stage of it at the time. Did it cost yeah. a lot of money? It was a lot for me at that time, yeah. But in the grand scheme of things, no, it's it was it's relatively affordable. But you know, sometimes uh, people will use an excuse of, "Oh, it's too expensive." But did you right. feel like there was there was there like an align? Did you feel like aligned with that possibility, and that's what made you decide to fork over? what was a lot of money to you at the time to, to take that leap? Um, it was something I knew I had to do for myself. So I didn't have the money for it. And that was my excuse. You know, so mm -hmm. Jenna, I, I would tell, I told Jenna I didn't have the money for it. And she was like, Leah, just buy the ticket and come. I will figure out where you can stay. Da, 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 da. Um, and I borrowed money. I asked different people to help me with it. I literally pulled together money at that point in time because like I said, I hadn't been working. Um, and it very much, I, I very much took the leap. It was a leap of faith and it was on the fly. And when I got here the first day, I ended up staying overnighting with someone in the program who I had never met before. Uh, and Jenna made that arrangement for me. I had never met this person. It was all on just completely out of my comfort zone. Um, and after the first day, then I met my friend Heather, who is my really good friend now. She offered to give me a ride back to where I was staying, and we became friends on that journey. And for the rest of the time that I was in the course, I um, I stayed with her. So it was very haphazard. There was no, there was nothing planned out here, but um, it, it was something that I knew I needed to do. It's interesting because a lot of people they move to Los Angeles to, you know, get discovered and for fame and for fortune you went there yeah. to, to discover yourself <laughs> yeah yeah and in many ways LA continues to be that for me yes self-discovery mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so then what was the um inspiration behind life and lemonade because I know when you moved to LA you, you were still kind of in modeling and 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 maybe maybe that was one of your main sources of income you're still doing some freelance attorney work um, I'm not sure what was going on with your charities at that time, but how did Life and Lemonade come into, come into your awareness? So when I moved to LA, I moved, at that, at what I call, what I call it, I moved for happiness and purpose and everything mm -hmm. in, in all categories of happiness and purpose. So that would have been career, relationship, family, that kind of thing. Um, and when I got here, everything that I had planned did not go as planned. <laughs> it completely fell through. 
And um, I was in a very painful space in my life where, you know, you build up this expectation of and a vision of what you think your life is going to be. And then life does not cooperate with you mm-hmm. um, or seemingly so life doesn't cooperate with you. And so, you know, for the first six months that I, I moved to LA, I wasn't working. Um, I was in a relationship. The relationship wasn't working. Mm-hmm. And um, and I really found myself at a, a place of rock bottom. I felt defeated. And it took me back, you know, after, and that's on the heels of having done clarity, uh, having done the course, sorry, therapy, and then finding clarity to then find yourself in an unclear space. So it almost felt like I was taking 10 steps back. Um, and so that, that just drove me into a new space of, of self-reflection. Um, and I became more vocal. I became more expressive during that time. I started talking about what was going on with me with different people. Um, and I realized the more I spoke to people, the more people had similar stories. Um, and then, you know, people's stories were similar to other people's stories. And I realized that we were all walking around with versions of things that were, you know, versions of stories that we owned that were, that were affecting our lives. Um, and that in many ways we could learn from each other. And so Life on Lemonade was birthed from my ability to, my, my wish to ventilate what I was dealing with and then give other people a safe space to ventilate and learn and be inspired by each other's stories so that we heal whatever trauma it is that we're walking around with. Um, and I figured that I was able to do that with my background in television. And so I, I just kind of pulled everything together, all the things that I was good at. I, well, how I describe it is like a Venn, I Venn diagrammed my life and I found the center of the Venn diagram and that's how life and lemonade was, was birthed. Hmm. So what was the first um, tangible step that you took in, in launching life and lemonade, you know, beyond the, just the idea phase? Did you have to talk to mm-hmm. someone? Did you go out and buy a camera? Did you book a a venue to record your first interview? Um, I spoke about it a lot with a friend of mine and um, I recorded it on my phone. I I didn't buy anything. I just said I would use what I have. And um, I had a friend at the time who's still a friend of mine, Marlon. He was my very first interview. Marlon was uh, your first one? Yeah. Peterson? Yeah, Marlon was my first interview. And you met um, him on one of your party boats, right? No, 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 party boat. I met him on a boat in Trinidad okay. years okay. earlier, but it wasn't a party boat. Um, okay. And uh, at that time, I actually uh, found out a bit of his story and I wanted to interview him. I think we did do an interview. Um, so Life and Lemonade was a, a, a sequel to the original idea, which was called Maverick, uh, where I wanted to show the Mavericks people who went against the grain. Um, And I I interviewed Marlon initially, but when I revisited and I created Life and Lemonade, Marlon was the very first interview and his story was incredible and is incredible. You know, he was one of your guests. Um, Mm -hmm. And so- Thanks to you, you connected us. (laughs) You're welcome. He, um, He was really an inspiration to me because he said to me, there was always light at the end of the, the tunnel like he there's Mm. always light can always enter and he you know his ability to transcend his 10-year prison sentence and to come out into the world and live with such hope and and faith then gave me the drive to do this show and so he became my first guest but he wasn't the first person you actually launched bianca was the first person that you actually launched so how many person. how many people did you interview before you actually launched it? I think I had um, I had three episodes in the can before I launched it. So I interviewed Bianca, Marlon, and then Carl Kanai. Those were my first uh, and and Zoya. Those were, sorry, four episodes. They were my mm-hmm. first first people. 
Now, having done these other charities and raised thousands of dollars and impacted all these people, did you have really high expectations for starting off in Life and Lemonade? And if so, were those expectations met or did you have to kind of adjust and, and settle in for the long term? It, no, it was very organic. Um, Life and Lemonade was just an expression, a creative mm -hmm. expression. I didn't go in with like, oh, I want this to be a network TV show or, or whatnot. I just wanted it to have the results of, you know, creating inspiration and giving people a space to share their stories. Um, and my prayer was and continues to be that as many people that, that could see it would see it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And it's only now that, you know, at least a year or two years have passed that I, I now start to think of the business structure of it truthfully. But at the time, it was very organic how it started. What was something that was more challenging than you thought? And what was something that was more pleasantly surprising than you expected about Life and Lemonade? What was more challenging was everything. <laughs> was everything. <laughs> everything was more challenging than I thought. Um, you know, growing an audience is always, is, um, always challenging because uh, you, you, you think you create this great story and you put it out and you just expect it to to have its own legs but it doesn't always work like that you know and so you very much have to treat it like a business and I'm a creative but I also have to be the business person behind this thing um, and then you know being a motivator is a very uh, heart-centered expression but being a a successful YouTuber, it requires a different part of your brain. And I think going between those two things was a challenge for me because I, I live in my heart space a lot, you know? So I go according to my feeling. Um, whereas the growing Life and Lemonade required me to be more structured. So that was a challenge. And what I loved about it or was pleasantly surprised by it was how fulfilled I was in sharing people's stories. Like just talking to people, like each episode ended up being like two hours, you know, cause I was just, I, I connected so deeply with it and I would always leave feeling so refreshed and I did not expect that. Not in the way, not to the depth that I, I continue to feel it. So I, I know in many ways that I'm on the right path because it, it fulfills me so much. I've also known you to be very focused and, you know, such a hard worker, you know, cause here you are Miss, former Miss Barbados at your computer at two in the morning, editing one of your own episodes. <laughs> oh, yeah. What are you, what's like motivating you? What's driving you to just keep showing up like that? Even though you may only be getting a hundred views on a video, like, what are you thinking about? Cause I have heard you in certain interviews, you've said that, you know, this project was on your heart because you meet girls who think that what you have done is out of their reach. Like, are you thinking, like, are you really that person thinking about those kinds of things at two in the morning or what's keeping you in the saddle? I mean, it's a combination of things, right? Um, but one is that I gave my word. So I started something that I feel like I need to finish, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, goes back to why I would go back to law school, you know? Um, it also goes back to just this, this kind of personality that I've built within myself or this expectation from high school, you know, discipline, being disciplined in school, being disciplined in law school. I just, I tap into a discipline um, and I hold myself to this, this level of integrity to, to continue to show up. And um, I think I'm aware that when I don't show up, it's because of fear or it's because of um, some kind of feeling of inadequacy. And so I try to push through that. I try to push myself through that and not let it consume me. And so that's why I keep showing up. And then I know that it's impacting people. Because every time I do put out an episode, I get feedback. You know, and I, I get people, you know, telling me how, how much it's impacted in their lives. And that's what that's what keeps me going. I know it's, it's mm -hmm. more about them than it is about myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you recently, meaning in the last couple of years you've started creating these um 
it's like you're obsessively creating these these planners and uh, this yearly wellness planner. And again, I know you, so I know you're, you're <laughs> probably the only person I know who actually has a planner that you write in. And I'm um, not the only person you know that I know that I know <laughs> that you know you carry it around with you everywhere you go. You write in it, and so naturally you're passionate about it. You know, even though we're in this digital age, <laughs> mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you created, you've created a, a um, how many have you done so far, including this year's, this next year's planner, two or three. So this is the second iteration of, of it. So I've Meaning done you did one and then, okay. Yeah. All right. So this one is called be, do, become. Yeah. Right. The yearly wellness planner for visionaries, not for slackers, yeah. not for, no. you know, procrastinators. <laughs> it's for aspiring visionaries. So even if you're a procrastinator now and you want to be a visionary, it's also for you. <laughs> what, what is driving this? Like, why are you so obsessed with with getting these planners out into the world? Mm, again, you know, Be Do Become was birthed out of, like I, I mentioned just now. Uh, the Venn diagram of my life. So I'm all I'm always looking for, even though Life and Lemonade has been a part calling of, you know, of mine. I didn't I didn't feel like I had that thing. Like I had arrived in the seat of the thing that was really really driving me. Like what my purpose is. And I've done a lot of therapy. I've done a lot of workshops. I've done a lot of personal development and, and worksheets and writing and journaling. Um, and planners have played a very integral role in my life. And yes, we're living in a digital age, but writing is so very cathartic, you know, mm -hmm. and it requires you to be present in a way that you don't get that presence digitally. It, you just don't, right? And so, I, you know, looking at my life, at all the things that I'm good at, looking at life and lemonade, looking at the work that we've done, and just the Venn diagram of my life, what is the center thing? Where do they all meet? And I remember one day I was sitting at my desk and I realized I had at least four planners, four different 2021 planners here that I bought. I wasn't using all of them, but I realized I had bought them for different things and that I did not have a planner that encapsulated everything that I wanted it to be, which was, you know, helping people find their vision or helping me find my vision, doing a vision exercise and then keeping that all in one place, having my vision board in one place, having my daily and weekly monthly planners in, in one place, but then also having a space to journal. I, I didn't have a planner that had contemplated both wellness and, and productivity. And so I decided then to, to create one. And it was, it just flowed out of me. It just poured out of me and in doing it, uh, the first iteration, which was last year, in doing that, I really found joy. I found myself in it. I don't know. It's 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 very me, as you say. You know, I walk around with my planner. It's very much a, a part of who I am. Well, Quincy Jones said that if you are, if whatever you're creating gives you goosebumps, then that means other people in the world are also going to get goosebumps when they come Aww. across it. Well, I receive that. I received that. Mm. Well, I just want to loop this back around the childhood. So then what was that like as a kid? Like, do you remember having a favorite toy or activity as a child? I mean, we'd spent a lot of time at the beach, um, but we, we I mean, wearing a, a bikini and being on the beach is definitely uh, a standard thing for us. Um, Sundays was a, a big beach day for families and stuff. Um, but, you know, the regular extracurricular activities, uh, dance, football, um, surfing for some people. That's the kind of stuff we would get into. Uh, and then for me, I guess my favorite toy, I had this um, this dollhouse that, <laughs> that I didn't know impacted my life until recently, but it was my favorite toy. Um, and it, it was this two-story dollhouse. It was beautiful. And I remember you can put you could have put batteries in it and turned the lamps on the outside of the dollhouse on, um, and it was just it was just fancy. It was beautiful. It was it shaped my 
view of the type of house that I always wanted to live in. It had a spiral staircase and, you know, just big windows, floor to ceiling windows and that kind of thing. So I would say that that was my favorite toy. What, what do you mean by it shaped it shaped you or, or influenced you? You just realized, what did you realize recently about, about the dollhouse? I, well, you know, I live in, in Los Angeles and mm -hmm. I really have a love for LA and the neighborhoods and driving through the neighborhoods. And I was reflecting uh, while driving through a neighborhood and I was like, what is it about these neighborhoods that get me, you know? Cause I have this way of just reflecting on everything. Um, and I, I, I brought it all the way back or took it all the way back to that specific dollhouse mm. that it looked, the dollhouse looked a lot like the houses in the neighborhoods that I would drive through. It looked like it represented a peaceful life. It represented an mm. easy life. Um, well manicured, you know, that kind of thing. So would you describe your childhood as peaceful and easy and well manicured? <laughs> I mean, it was in many ways at the time. Um, my childhood was, was very adventurous. I was a very adventurous kid and busy. I, I did a lot of extra, I, I danced a lot. Um, and when I wasn't doing that, I was, you know, riding my bike or rollerblading. I was very much a an active kid, like out in the neighborhood. Uh, my neighborhood is comprises um, like avenues, multiple avenues, one after the other. And I would leave home and ride out of my avenue and into other avenues and be gone for like hours and then come back, you know, um, with my friends. So it was very active. Um, me and my neighbors, you know, we grew up in a neighborhood. So there were neighbors that I always played with. And it was, it was, it was good. I, I enjoyed my, my childhood. I've heard you say that in Barbados, they really stress academia, academia. Um, I've heard you say that in child, uh, I've heard you say that in Barbados, they really stress academia. And uh, so was that something that was a topic of conversation in your house growing up with your parents? Were they, were they always talking about your grades and you have to make sure you do good in school and you have to become a the lawyer or doctor or anything like that? Or, or what were they talking about? Um, I don't, I think luckily for me, I had, my parents were pretty, let, let me just say that there, there was an expectation that you would apply yourself. There was an expectation mm -hmm. of excellence and, and uh, good performance in, in school. You know, your report card at the end of the year was a, was something you wanted to make sure looked good, you know. <laughs> um, but within my household, I think my, my parents gave me a lot of space to be myself and, they weren't very strict or I shouldn't say they, they, they focused on academia, but they weren't hovering with it, um, which I respect a lot. But it's definitely a societal expectation that you will do well in school. What was your favorite memory of your dad? Mm. Um, favorite memory of my dad. Or one of the I favorite have... memories of your dad. I don't have many, I don't have many memories of him during that time, but what I, what I am fond of, I do remember that he used to, he used to play the guitar and sing uh, country and western songs and that kind of, and he would record himself. So he would be playing and he would have uh, the stereo on record. He had this glass stereo, I remember. Um, and he would make these tapes of him recording and I would be present for that and um, try to record on it with him and that kind of thing. So that stick, stuck with me because it, it was a, a creative expression that I think I carried with me, you know, throughout my life. And I do remember him saying as much as he would let me sit there with him as he recorded these songs, he, was, he would very much say, do not touch the guitar because I was very much that child that will like play the guitar as if, you know, I knew what I was doing. So, yeah. Did he sing? Did he have a good voice? Yeah, I think so. 
Um, I like I said, I don't I don't remember much. In fact, I I went on a hunt recently to find those tapes, hmm. um, which I have I located them, but I haven't retrieved them. But yeah, he did have a voice. He could play the guitar. He was very artistic, actually. Um, he used to make wall art as well. Um, now that we're actually having this conversation, I realize that he's equally as he was an accountant by profession, but was mm-hmm. also simultaneously very creative. And I actually think that's the first time I made that comparison to myself, that I'm, I'm a lawyer, but I'm also creative. Mm. So he was Thank really an know. artist that was kind of posing as an accountant. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Exactly. Maybe he had a dream to be, I don't know, some kind of rock star or country and Western artist or something. So talk about that experience when you were 11 years old and you found out that uh, he had to go to Miami. What, what, what was that like for you? Yeah, I think um, I was in school uh, during that time. And uh, I remember having a breakdown, um, you know, crying in class and my teacher was asking what was wrong. And I told her that my dad had to go to Miami, but and I, and I was hysterically crying. But I actually didn't know why he went to Miami. I just knew that it was the first time that he had traveled away from me from what seemed like an um, inexplor- unexplained period of time. Um, and that's, I think that is the point where I, based on my recollection, that I came to know that he was actually sick. So that was the first time that they explained to me that he had to go to Miami for an operation and that he had a brain tumor. He collapsed at work. Um, and that he would go to Miami, have this operation to come back and he'd be fine. But when he did come back, he didn't come home. Um, and it so turned out that the operation removed his short-term memory. Mm-hmm. And so from there, he went into um, you know, treatment and he was in the hospital after that. So, and and it, he pretty much deteriorated shortly after that um, mm-hmm. and passed away, so. I didn't see much of him after that moment in time. I think my family became pretty protective of of me. They they didn't want me to see him in that state, I guess. Um, yeah, and he, he passed shortly, a couple months, probably like six months after that, I think. Would you say that experience made you less focused as a student or more focused? Um, it's interesting, right? you would think that losing a parent in the middle of school would make you, and and I guess it does for some people, it would make you distracted. But I think the way I dealt with my grief at that age was instead of expressing my emotions through, you know, sadness or tears or whatnot, I actually became extremely hyper-focused and extremely disciplined. So I poured a lot of, you know, I, well, I guess I just focused on what I could control, which were which were my grades. So I became extremely focused. And what did you see yourself um, becoming when you quotes grew up? Hmm. I actually um, never really saw myself becoming anything. I just knew. I remember saying at six years old that I wanted to be an authority. I didn't, didn't know what I wanted to be an authority. Meaning, you want to tell people what to do? <laughs> I I don't even know that that was the thing because I don't think I told people what to do even at at a young age. I very much was on my own beat, as we would say. Um, but I I I guess I felt like an authority was some person of of stature, and I wanted to be that, but I didn't know in what. Um, and I never really saw myself becoming anything in particular I know I was very much a dancer at that age when I was younger and I was into art I I drew a lot um, Mm -hmm. and that was my focus but I never thought of a career to be honest did you have an idea of what success would look like for someone like you from Barbados single parent like making Mm -hmm. enough money to take care of your family or anything like that I think growing up in school, I didn't think of sucks. I didn't think of the big picture in that way. I think after losing a parent, 
life gets very real mm-hmm. and your focus is very much on the present and and for me I didn't have the luxury of like dreaming of this big future I just became very hyper focused on providing for myself and my mom who in my 11 year old mind became my responsibility believe it or not um and I know she would hate to hear me say that but that's just how I processed it you know um and so I felt like whatever I needed to do to provide for us or to make the load easier for her that was the thing that I was going to do so at 14 years old I started working at a material store um during the summers and during the 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 uh Christmas vacations or Easter vacation, I would go to work at a material store and I would make money to buy my the material for my school uniforms and to buy my books and that kind of thing. And in my mind, I was doing it to ease my mom's burden. You know, so she would just focus on the things like the house and I would take care of everything else. So success for me was it was just um surviving, I guess. So how are you thinking about success these days? You know, success for me is harmony now, you Mm. know, harmony, a balance uh, of life, of family, of wellness, um, and purpose. Mm -hmm. That's that's success success to me. And I feel like I'm living in success in many ways. Things are not perfect. Life isn't perfect. And I do not have all the things that I have, but I have a really strong center and a really strong foundation um of wellness you know and i'm building stronger relationships with my family my family members and i'm you know i have this planner and i'm walking in purpose and i'm living in service to others and so in many ways i feel like i've achieved definitely some level of success i mean there are other things that i desire and i i pray for but yeah if you could go back to young, I don't know, 19 year old Leah, Mm -hmm. and, you know, come to her through a dream and offer her some words of wisdom. What's something that you would, you would tell your younger self? Uh, Feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? I think because of, you know, my father's passing and then losing my best friend at 18 I went into a very transactional space in in my life and um, disconnected myself from my feelings so Mm -hmm. I you know I didn't want to feel love because I didn't want to feel pain and so the Mm -hmm. people that I loved I, I kept at a distance and even myself in many ways I kept myself at a distance from me um which is so ironic because I was still roaming the world and searching the world for me. And I was still searching for like love and that connection that I was simultaneously pushing away, you know, subconsciously so. Um, And I think that if I just took the time to feel my feelings, I would have cried about the things that I needed to cry about. And I would have been angry about the things I needed to be angry about. I would have faced my, self I would have discovered where my pain was I would have discovered because of discovering where my pain would I would was I would just also discover where my joy was and I would have quicker tapped into the things that made me happy and what was fulfilling to me so I think that would be the greatest message for her would be to feel her feelings and I encourage anybody now to sit with your feelings you know a lot of that is you know in the the work that I do now where just be present with what it is that is passing through your body, what what your heart is calling for, what your heart is dealing with, because it gives you information on this path, this life path that you're on. Hmm. Yeah. Um, this is a bit of a random question, but do you feel like your dad is still looking down on you? And if so, how does he communicate that? Like, do you hear a random country song somewhere and like, that's my dad? Or do you feel something in your body in certain moments? Mm -hmm. You know, from time to time, I guess, through different life experiences, um, I would get random memories, I think, of him would pop up. 
um, or I might hear the sound of his voice randomly. Mm. Um, so in many ways, you know, I don't, I don't, I, a person leaves, but they, they never leave your heart. And they, so right. in many ways, they, they, they stay with you. Um, but I have, I have placed him where he is, I should say. So I don't carry him like a load on my back, but he is a, he is a visitor in my heart, you know, from time to time, especially when I do experience like significant moments in my life, I would always think about what he would think or what he would say, you know, and even how I, how I show up in the world, how do I represent him and how does he show up in the world through me? Because, you know, genealogy and just condition and all that you ad you adopt things from your parents that are subconscious and so in many ways I wonder how you know he shows up through me but yeah I do think of him and experience him from time to time beautiful well I just want to loop this back around the childhood and uh <laughs> was, we knew this was coming <laughs> You mentioned the dollhouse and um, mm -hmm. and what that represents to me is a, a feeling of safety, you know, homes, being at home. And um, and then particularly a dollhouse where you can turn on the lights. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you, what you've done in your life is you've you've made the central theme about service, about helping other people heal which is basically what you were wanting to do for yourself so you're being the change that you want to see and it's through the healing it's through walking in purpose that we find our sense of inner peace and therefore our sense of safety no matter what kind of chaos and turmoil is happening around us so i yeah. uh, just want to acknowledge you for all of the choices that you had to make to stay on your path even though it wasn't easy and um, and you. for continuing to work in your purpose and for sharing your stories, your personal story, as well as the stories of the people that you come across that inspire you and sharing those stories so openly and transparently and, uh, and vulnerably. And I want everybody to, to uh, binge watch life and lemonade TV <laughs> on YouTube and um What's a good episode for people for the people to start with to get hooked into your mm. your uh, your shows? Mm, there's so many. They're all really so good. But the first episode with Bianca, I know a lot of people resonate with. Um, mm -hmm. Marlon's ep Marlon's episode of his his bid his ten year prison bid, and then recently I did one with Walshy Fire from Major Laser, and you know it was the first time that he shared you know family trauma as as a caribbean jamaican man that doesn't talk about these things um he was very much inspired by dms's death to share mm. a very vulnerable story of his life and that that was profound in many ways you know so those three i would say start with well there you have it start with those three <laughs> and then also the yearly wellness planner it's very much an artisanal project. You created it and you had it printed. It wasn't like some kind of, you know, Amazon self-publishing thing. It's, it's you actually going to the printers, approving yes. the drafts and everything. So it's really, really beautifully done. And uh, where, can, where can people find that? So they can follow us on Instagram at BDB Wellness Planner. Say that again, um, slow it, slower. BDB, B do become abbreviated. DB, okay. BDB Wellness Planner. So that's on Instagram, or you can follow me, Leah Marvel, on Instagram. But you can purchase it on my website, leahmarvel.com. And there's a tab there for the Wellness Planner. And yeah. Do we get it like in two it. days? Like, is it prime? Is it is it prime competitive? <laughs> what's, what's the deal? Yeah, two to two to three days uh, in most places you have it beautiful all right well thank you very much leah for sharing your story you. if you like that video you're gonna love the next one click this thumbnail right here and i'll see you over there